what layer of the vessel does paclitaxel affect? Who can tell me that? What layer, which one of the three layers of a artery does paclitaxel affect m the most? Yep, why Jay? Because the, most of the stem cells goes on within the Within the media? Yep. And why does paclitaxel, or well, how does paclitaxel impact that layer? Uh, stopping the some substance to get into the media to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it inhibits smooth muscle cell growth, doesn't it? All right, we know that from from our alluvia training, okay? So with a drug-coated balloon, it does exactly the same thing, same mechanism of action, right? It, um, it's, it, it causes this kind of metaphase sort of uh, response and s stops the smooth muscle cells from proliferating, growing, okay? And causing a restenosis in the vessel. That, that's how it works. Now, the only way it can get through the endothelium or the lesion or whatever into that, into the smooth muscle cell is if it's got some sort of <coughs> soft tissue to move through. Okay, so calcium is very hard like glass, right? So the drug can't, it's very dense. The drug can't make it through that dense kind of plaque. All right, that dense calcium. So we need to do something about that. We either need to crack it open and make fissures in between it so that the drug can track through the fissures, through here, through the cracks, right? So the drug can move through there into our <coughs> medial layer, right? Or we need to debulk it out, yeah? So complexity now is not just about length, it's about Lumen, it's about prep, the ability to get the drug into the vessel. And that's what Finale's paper says, right? It adds a categorization to um, help assess how complex the lesion is and whether the drug is likely to get in there and stop that smooth muscle cell proliferation or not. So, uh, most physicians have seen this, right? If they've been to any kind of link meeting or a, you know, any kind of endovascular meeting for the last couple of years, they've seen this slide. It's been in so many <coughs> presentations. Um, so I, mo most of them should get this. There's one little issue with this though. Can anyone tell me what the problem is with this concept? So it says 25%, 50%, 75% or 100% calcium coverage in the vessel of a diameter. Can anyone tell me a, a bit of a problem with that if you take that concept out to physicians in terms of treatment? We don't know exactly what using. Do they all use IVIS? Do they all use IVIS? They don't, do they? No. No. Can you tell that on an angiogram? No, no they don't. Okay, they can't, can't tell that on an angiogram reliably at all. Okay, usually they'll just do one kind of AP <laughs> shot, right? If you're lucky they might do an LAO or an RAO, you know, and get a little bit more of an idea. The really, you know, the really judicious physicians. Other than that, you're, you're really using a 2D plane to determine this, right? <coughs> so, if you don't know what that is, the best thing you can do is make sure you spend time on the vessel preparation, okay? And whether that's plain balloon or jet stream, okay? Because if you can't tell, the best thing, you, the next best thing you can do is just do what you can to prep it, crack it open, cause some cracks in it, or debulk it that, that way, okay? How do you know you make a proper cracks throughout? Volume, not just you always need to use IVOS? Yeah, you, um, 
Yeah, you, 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 you do really. I mean, if, to do Jetstream properly, um, you know, Ivis, using Ivis would be the gold standard. Well, it's not. It's just not always realistic. That's that's the issue. I don't think the poor part doesn't really make sure that you're you're going to have the proper cracks. Yeah. The pressure will be can be all be from um, the balloon. Yeah. No. Look, you, you're um you're right, and that's where the jet stream plus DCB studies start to kick in and show the the difference between that, and that's that's why we have a atherectomy system, and we believe in that too for that for that reason. Um, you know, having said that, having said that, um, vessel prep with POBA plus DCB has better results than just POBA on its own, or in fact, most drug, uh, sorry, bare metal stents in, in slightly longer lesions. So, you know, there, there is a case that something's happening. They are, you know, that, that, uh, the reason this came up is that um, not just this one, there's another one as well where they took um, five fresh human cadavers, put paclitaxel in their calcified arteries and then excised those arteries out and had a look and they could really see where the drug just had not penetrated the, the, the calcium into, into the vessel. So there's, you know, there's uh, you know, human cadaver models that sort of show us that. Um, but it's sort of the next best thing you can do, mm. you know, for for relatively little amount of money. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that's something to familiarise yourself with. Um, is Finale, the Finale paper, Fabrizio Finale. Um, he's a, um, an Italian, relatively young Italian uh, um, physician. But uh, quite well known and good, good scientific uh, base for us uh, for this study. Okay, um, I'm going to skip over this one because we've already done the algorithm, right? All, all you should really be concentrating on is this kind of task. Um, you know, simple complex. The, the issue with this again though is it's kind of based on that old model of length causes complexity and it does consider a little bit CTO. In my mind I tend to just break it up into, you know, have they got some flow and they can walk, you know, basically kind of move around um, or are they, do they have acute, really acute symptoms that need to be treated. Yeah. So this is uh, this is the biology of restenosis, right? The biology of what kind of restenosis? De novo or in stent? Or are they the same? Ah? Huh? You think it'll be the same? Not, not the same. Not, not the same. Yeah, it's quite an interesting one because I, you know I, I don't have a scientific answer for that one at the moment. But it would be nice to have at some point to know whether there's a difference in this cascade between a stent or or no stent. Uh, but um, you're right. Yeah, this is uh, de novo restenosis, right? That the cascade of de novo restenosis in peripheral arteries here. So which phase the packet cell work the most? Most must cell. Yeah. So, uh, who 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 can answer? Whereabouts? Whereabouts does drug coated balloons work on this? What time frame? Who, who can tell me what the sort of general elution time for a drug coated balloon is? How long is the paclitaxel there for, on average? For the whole class, not just for Ranger, for the whole class. Does anyone know? From to the end. Six, six to 90 days. Exactly. 60 to 90 days. Okay? It's what we call. Burst dose. Okay? Drug coated balloons are a burst dose device. 
Okay, we give a burst, a bolus burst of drug uh, in that first kind of 30 to 60, 90 days, right? We call that burst dosing because it's in comparison to what? So if we've got burst dosing on drug coated balloons, what would we have on drug eluting stents like Alluvia? Right, we have sustained dosing, right? So we have burst dosing there and we have sustained dosing with Alluvia. So two quite different, quite different profiles there, right? Okay, so when you come back to your patient discussion, right, that, what I've just told you here, has complicated things a little bit, right? Has complicated things a little bit. And the reason is that if you've got a patient, let's say you've got a patient that has, lives two hours away, right? Can't be treated two hours away, comes in, 70 years old, they've got SFA disease, relatively, let's say 120 mil lesion, 70 years old, had to catch the train, you know, nobody else at home, they're kind of looking after themselves, right? As a physician, if you're doing the best thing for that patient, what are, the, what are some of the best things you can be doing for that patient? As I'll pose it as a question rather than a, a statement. What do you think that patient wants? The 70 year old lady that's got the 120 mil lesion, she's traveled two hours into the hospital, what do you think she wants? She doesn't want to come to the hospital again. That, that's, there couldn't be a more perfect answer than that, right? If you ask most 70, 80 year olds, you know, the last thing they want to do is come back two hours again. They just want to enjoy their life outside a hospital as much as possible, right? So if that was my grandmother, and I was sitting there with the doctor, I'd be saying, can you give her a sustained dose device, please? Okay? Because that's the best chance of not coming back at the moment, right? It's got the highest rate of patency, it's got the high, lowest rate of target lesion revascularization, and it's gonna give her the best chance of not coming back to hospital, more days out of hospital, enjoying her life, doing what she wants to be doing, right? Okay, so I had the treatment algorithm up at the start. It all looks very nice and very neat and smart until you start talking about real patients, right? And that's what you need to be asking your doctor about these real patients. How many of these patients come in from out? So, and then you can work out. If I've got a patient that's half an hour down the road, it's 50 years old, come in with acute limb ischemia, they're a smoker, something like that, then get what you need to do, give them a burst dose of paclitaxel, and if they come back in a year or two years time, do it again, all right? It's quick, it's cheap, it leaves nothing behind, Right, you've got plenty of options for that patient, they're 50, you can keep treating them, no problems, right? But, the, that might not, the, the, those two patients could have exactly the same disease, but if one's two hours away and 70 years old, then you might make a dis different decision. And that's what you guys need to figure out. That's the discussion you need to have with your doctors, okay? Don't get too caught up on the product. Get really caught up on the patients. <coughs> Yeah? Okay, so burst dose. If we have a look at the um, biology of uh, restenosis, if, if we look at this, it looks like that the bulk of it is happening around this kind of seven month mark, somewhere between the three and the 10, right? So it's happening somewhere around the six, seven month mark. So shouldn't we be having, don't we need a device that keeps putting drug out at six months? Not necessarily. Look where it starts. Okay, drug coated balloons are trying to stop this whole lump from happening in the first place. Okay, so for a de novo lesion like that, where it's restenosis st starts, the bulk of it starts, you know, the bulk of it starts somewhere here, they start happening here, then 
you need to arrest it in this phase and stop this whole hump from happening in the first place. That's what we're trying to do. Okay? Is stop that smooth muscle cell proliferation bump from existing. Yeah? And that's why you have this big burst dose here to try and arrest this phase in the first place. Okay? Any questions? Any questions about that mechanism? It's pretty straightforward. This stuff's pretty simple, right? Um, there's no no great, you know, big detailed technical science that you have to remember for that. You just have to remember that the bulk of it is in that one to three months, and that's what we're trying to act on. Okay, for the patients that you don't want to leave anything behind on. Okay. So do you want to talk about the do you want to talk about the coating itself? how the coating's made, yeah? Can anyone tell me what the coating, we call it Transpax, that's just the trade, trademark name, but what is this stuff that you can see here? Yep, speak up. Yep, in what form? Okay, in crystalline form. Exactly. Okay, so that's what it, uh, I'll just move on and see if I can uh, find the thing for that. It's crystalline form, let me see, sorry guys. Just see if it's got the one slide that I want to see that. The reason we have this crystalline form, as opposed to, does anyone know what the um, type of coating that Impact uses is? Urea. Urea, yep. And ours is a crystalline coating, right? Ours is a crystalline coating. The urea coating is a what type of coating? Well, yep, they all, all, even crystalline has an amount of hydrophilia, hydrophobia, but the coating that the impact balloon uses is what they call an amorphous. An amorphous coating. Yeah. And I think uh, here we can see it, right? This um, impact coating, see this here? Amorphous. It's what they call uh, almost like the way to think about it is that it's a very uniform coating. Okay? Like if you spray painted something, you would have an amorphous, very uniform coating. Okay? Um, whereas we have a very amorphous coating, a very crystalline structure, like this. Yeah. The reason why we have this very crystalline uh, structure is that we use a citrate, a crystalline citrate ester, and we can tune that to, um, to stay on the balloon while it's going all the way down to the lesion, and then release into the tissue once it's there. Okay, we can control that release and how much we lose off the balloon and all that sort of thing much better with a crystalline coating than we can with an amorphous coating. Okay, you, the reason is very simple, right? See here how we've got this little plate here, little kind of flake of stuff? When, when, when it cracks, it's like bark, the amorphous coating. A big bit peels off and away it goes, right? If bits of ours come off, you're only use like crumbs, right? You lose little crumbs, little nanoparticles. So that's the difference, right? 
One's very particulate and one's very like flake stuff. Okay? That's that's really the difference. Yeah? Amorphous. Yeah, I can write it up for you if you like. Amorphous. If you've seen the Matrix, like Morpheus. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there was uh, two types on the like coding. Amorphous, amorphous and crystalline on the types of the uh, coding type and also hydrophilic and hydrophobic, right? Yes, so um, even amorphous codings, both of these um, have a, a mix of hydrophilia, hydrophobia, okay, and a mix of lipophilia, lipophobia, okay? What's lipophilia? What does that mean? It's easy to dissolve in lipid, right? In lipids, right? Yeah. So it will easily be attracted into. Philic means to like, right? It likes fat. Hydrophilic means it likes water, right? It'll be attracted to that. Phobia means it doesn't like it, right? That's the easiest way to remember it. So, um, I do have a, a slide in another presentation I'll put up and I'll show you exactly where all of these balloons sit. So, Ranger, Impact, Lutonics, where they all sit on that scale of hydrophilia versus hydrophobia. And um, I think it's got lipophilia versus lip lipophobia, but I think it's more really about that hydrophobia, um, hydrophilia, because it's, it's that that affects um, how much you lose off the balloon as you're tracking it. Okay? How much of it's going to be washed off by water in your blood as you're tracking down to the lesion. Okay? The proof of our design is the study we did on how much you lose in the different designs. Crystalline versus amorphous, hydrophilic versus hydrophobia. Okay, balancing those things. So you can see here, we have a very, very low downstream particulate versus lutonics versus impact. Okay in our bench testing. Why is that important? Why do you think this is important, James? What, 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 what do you think is... Why do you think it's important to have a low amount of downstream particulate? Anyone can, anyone can jump in if they want to. Why do we think this, this is particularly important? There's a couple of reasons. If you, want, if you prefer to answer in Korean, that's fine. Jade will, uh, or, uh, Jade or Sung Chan or someone will... Uh, yeah. I think you need to relate to the monitoring. Yep. So it's related to the... Mortality. Yeah, yeah, okay. Related to the mortality. Yeah, okay. It's related to the morbidity, so you're very, very close. Related to the morbidity. So the difference between the mortality and morbidity is mortality is a death rate. Morbidity, though, is an injury rate, right? So, yeah, you're on the right track there. Absolutely on the right track, Don. That's very good. So the, the, that that's... Something that we that the physicians are a little bit concerned about, and this all came up because when Im Impact was doing their BTK study, their Amphirian Deep study, the study got halted because the amputation rate was much higher in the Impact of Amphirian Deep arm versus the uh, versus the control arm. 
and they stopped the trial. And one of the things that they postulated was that potentially this downstream particulate was either causing some sort of micro vessel embolization or the paclitaxel itself was inhibiting ulcerative um, uh, disease repair or you know the healing of ulcers, something like that. that the, all of these theories came out. So at that point it became important to us to make sure we made a balloon that didn't recreate that potential issue. W whatever the issue was, all right, we don't know exactly what the causal effect is, there's no, no one knows what the actual causal link was, but what we do know is that something was happening downstream, so we needed to make a balloon that didn't send a lot of par particulate downstream, and any particulate that did go downstream was small-ish in nature compared to the amorphous coatings, okay? So that's what you have here in this, that's what that slide says, okay? Is that what... So you're saying that uh, the different coating technologies make that difference? You know, downstream, yeah. lower downstream particulate? Yes. But, I mean, I was wondering that, uh, what about rock delivery? Uh, the different experience, experience makes uh, more effective drug delivery or something? Yeah, so that, that's a that's a that's a great question. So the, the the question, just just to make sure I understand it right, is does urea give you a better drug uptake than citric ester, or in the lutonics, the case of lutonics, they use something called sorbitol, right? They use like this this uh, almost like a sugar based uh, based uh, excipient, right? Or carrier. Well, I think I can answer that question for you in the COMPARE trial. But even customers are not sure about that. Yeah. We asked some questions about that. The answer that you can give them is, well, what does the evidence say? What does the current evidence say? And when we put our balloon ranger in a one-to-one -one trial with impact, right? non-inferiority, we get non-inferiority, but we get it with two milligrams, two, sorry, two, two uh, micrograms yeah, per millimetre squared versus three and a half per millimetre squared. So it's a good question whether or not it's relevant is another, is another question because, well, we can get the same result clinically, the out same outcome they can get, but with much less drug and much less downstream particulate. So good question, but I think you need to reframe the question back to them and say, well, you know, that, that could be true, Doc, but the data shows that even if we use citrate ester, we can still get the same results as they get. As they get. Now, potentially, could it be improved? Mm, maybe, but yeah. So here is pretty much what I've just said there okay so it's a balance of hydrophilic and hydrophobic um, properties the urea based one you'll see on that scale impact sits right down the hydrophilic end okay lutonics is, um, is uh, similar I'll, I'll bring it up so you can have a look one of the one of the um, things that you'll see in the IFU for the other balloons, the instructions for use for the other balloons is that they have a maximum time you're allowed to actually get to the lesion. Right? So they say once you've introduced the balloon you're not allowed to take any more than 60 or 120 seconds to get to the lesion. Right? Because you lose too much drug off the balloon. Do we have that in our instructions for use for Ranger? Nope. We don't. Okay. The stability of our coating means we don't have to have that in our instructions for use. Okay. So the, that's one thing if you've got a Lutonics user and they used to like, oh, do, do, am I going to have to really get this to the lesion quickly? All right. No. 
you can, oh really? I don't have to worry about that? What about if the drug washes off on the way down? No, no. We have a very good balance of hydrophilia and hydrophobia. And so it's the actual mechanism of inflating our balloon into that tissue that allows the release of the excipient, not simply blood washing over the top of it. That's the stability of our coating. That's the difference. Okay. No, no, crystalline. Yeah, yeah. Urea, the impact balloon is the only one that uses the, uh, the uh, um, or maybe, I don't know if Stellarex does actually, that's a good, because they use shellac, you know, the stuff you use for your fingernails, <laughs> uh, fingernail coating, shellac that girls put on their fingernails, uh, that, that's, that's the stuff they use on the uh, Stellarex one, they, I'm not sure if that one's a amorphous coating, but uh, yeah, pretty much Medtronic's the only, yeah. Okay, so do we feel comfortable with the, the actual carrier? What's the trick? What's the carrier called? Citrate ester. Its trademark name is? Transpax. Yep. Transfer of paclitaxel. That's what the trans... Uh, yep. <laughs> Uh, they must have been up all night thinking of that. <laughs> Is that on film? Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, adhesion to the balloon to allow tracking so it's nice and stable. It's got good stability on the balloon so we don't lose it down. And it allows good transfer to the vessel wall with minimal particle loss, okay? So that's, that's, that's the coating, all right? The reason why I've kind of labored the point about coating is yes, there is some talk about efficacy, but I prefer to talk about efficacy in terms of clinical evidence, not in terms of features, okay? Right? Most doctors I know want some evidence for efficacy, right? Most doctors can make a logical leap to safety on features and benefits. Very hard to make a logical leap to efficacy. Okay, so the reason I've laboured the point about the coding is that you should be able to articulate the, the safety of the way we've designed our coding. Okay, we'll talk about the, the efficacy when we come to evidence, right? That'll prove out the design features for efficacy. All right. So, am I talking about this? Where where does this fit in then? The coding. Who's the coding for? What, what are we going to be? What what discussion is that going to be in? Is it going to be in a discussion about patients? Yeah. Why not? It's patient safety, right? Patient safety. Okay. Your high risk. CLI ulcerative disease patients, do you really want to be sending, putting a product in there that potentially has downstream particulate? Or would you prefer something that's got a nice stable coating that at least you know if you're delivering it you're not sending a whole lot of stuff downstream? Okay, patient safety, definitely. Is it a physician, is it a physician discussion? Yes. Why? They can take more time to deliver it. Some physicians are very, very high, have a very, very sort of high expectation in terms of safety for any device they use, right? That's their main thing. I'll use it, but it has to be really safe. Okay, and that's, so sometimes, yeah, it is gonna come into that. So that's where these two fit, right? It's not really a payer discussion. It doesn't really matter to them, right? Um, and product, well, that's for your product knowledge, sure. Okay, so um, I'm not going to talk about the development of paclitaxel. Um, we've talked about that. So you, you see how we, uh, we did this? Buffered saline. Basically, buffered saline is just this saline that they put phosphates into to make it like um, blood 
the consistency of blood, right? Like almost like Ringer's solution, if you know what that is. So um, basically, it's designed to mimic the caustic environment of being in blood. Yeah. Obviously, with saline, it's got a very high salt, co salt content in the water, but it's water essentially as well, which means that it helps us be able to determine how much wash off we're going to get. Right? At 37 degrees, so temperature, why 37 degrees? Human temperature, right? Okay, and then, and then we have a look at, you know, we magnify it up 300 and we can see. Uh, what's happening after these, after this time, right? Three minutes and then ten minutes. Okay. How are we going for time? Quarter two. We're, we're all right. Does anyone want to ask any questions about the coating? I think I'm going to finish, finish there on the coating. All right. One question, James. You yeah. mentioned that you know, in fact, other competitors, they claim that you got to cross the region within like two minutes or something. <coughs> Is that because they worry about, you know, like particulate laws follow le leading to embolization or they were uh, failing to deliver good enough amount of the drug? Both. <coughs> both. I'm, I, both, but I, I'm, I'm always a little bit hesitant to get into that discussion. Mm -hmm because um, it blends the safety and the efficacy discussion. One's a safety problem and one's an efficacy problem, right? But I don't think that at the beginning, when they launched the DCV in the market, they probably didn't worry about the safety issue. They didn't know about it, yeah, 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 exactly. The, the, the question of whether you lose too much drug off the, 